quitting my day job I'm going into music now okay so I was gonna do one board um, summarizing a little bit of last time because the way I introduce standing waves we cover a little bit of detailed math that you really don't need so I want to make sure you didn't lose the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest or however whichever way that goes so standing waves the main point about the standing waves is that they occur at uh, certain frequencies. That was the hallmark property. Remember, so we tune the little thing around and suddenly a standing wave would pop out. That's a little bit of revisionist history, I know. You said, I think I see something, but let's just say a standing wave pops out. Amazing. And uh, when we did math, or we, if we wanted to draw them again, Let's draw them all together so you can see how they're a series, right? So the first one, was we have a string that's clamped at the ends, and we said, oh, okay, well, it has to be some chunk of a sinusoid. So it looks like that. So remember, the dotted line, is, or the solid line, is one part of the oscillating phase, and then the dotted is the other. And when you watch it in real time, you just see a blur. So this would be where we said that value of m equals 1, okay? So this, uh, I'm going to start telling you the lingo, just so you can be cool. It's called the fundamental, okay? The lowest one is the fundamental. Yes, now you're a cool, believe it or not, okay? The next one is just what, what's the next sign you can cram in there? Well, I could put a full sine wave, and then it would be like this out of phase, or, you know, half cycle later would be like that, and that's m equals 2. That's called, I'm not cool, hold on, I forgot what it's called. I forgot what I wanted to say it's called. <laughs> I'm so uncool. The second harmonic, oh yeah, sorry, I knew that, I knew that, second harmonic, the second harmonic, it really just means the second mode. And if we wanted to keep going, how do we fit yet one more uh, in there but keep the ends clamped, we say, oh, it must be that it's doing that. And then half cycle later, it must be like that. Three, third harmonic, okay? And etc., all the way down to infinity, okay? So you'll hear us say uh, just the first mode, second mode, third mode, but you might see these words, the fundamental, the second harmonic, but you can see it's pretty clear. It's just one, two, three, okay? First mode, second mode, third mode. You may hear me say normal modes every now and then. If you want to be really cool, you call it a normal mode, and that's because these are actually very fundamental in physics. They have lots of names because you can describe any motion of this string just by adding these up with Fourier series sophomore physics or watch the 48 lecture YouTube thing I put up. Someone will watch it. I will track it. Somebody's watching it. Oh my God. I gotta figure out who it is. Um, so uh, let's see. So we also calculated, we spent a lot of time calculating what are the wavelengths of these things and what are the frequencies. And the wavelengths you can actually get without even thinking about how fast or anything about time. The wavelength is just cramming it into L. Right, if the string has some length L, how do we cram a wave in there that's clamped at both ends? Well, this one you say, well, then uh, the lambda must be 2L, right? Because the wave, half the wave is through L, so if we were gonna carry that forward, the other half would be the same length as this half, so it'd be 2L wide. If we look at this one, which is L, right? One wavelength is equal to one L. And then we look at the third one, and you say, well, there's one and a half, so you invert three halves, and it's two-thirds L. The wavelength is uh, two-thirds L. Oh, well, you can see it directly, right? So here's a wavelength, and then that's two-thirds of the full L. And we came up with a formula, then in general, the wavelength lambda is uh, two L over M, okay? So what I want you to know is that all the math we did to get that is we applied boundary conditions to the general normal uh, standing wave formula, and we thought about where could sign KL equals zero. You don't have to do that anymore. That's one of those things we did it once to get the answer, and now you just use the answer, okay? So you could probably even memorize this one. Lambda is 2L over M. Right? That's all the complicated physics we're doing right there. We could also calculate the frequencies, and uh, really it's straight from this. If you know the velocity, you get the frequencies, because you remember that frequency is velocity um, over wavelength, sorry. 
over lambda. So really, I can do it real fast and look like I've memorized them, but I'm just sticking a v over this. Right? So the first one, oh, it's just v over 2l. Oh, yeah, it's just v over l. Oh, this one, oh, it's 3v over 2l. Right? All I'm doing is dividing v by that really fast. Right? That's all I'm doing. In the formula, the same thing. Oh, well, it's just uh, v divided by 2l over m, and I'm going to bring that m in the denominator denominator to the top. So, oh, yeah, it must be m times v over 2l. There's the other formula. So for probably half the problems in this chapter, it's just these two formulas. It's pretty much all you need. Okay? You don't have to have all the other stuff. Now, certain horrible physicists like me, and I guess I'll say Dr. Stenson, I'll throw him under the bus with me, have ways of writing problems where you've got to really, in addition to be able to use those two equations, you've got to really kind of understand what's going on. So there'll be some of those. But in terms of math, this is pretty much it for what we've done so far. Okay? Okay, here's a few other happy bull oh, not happy bullets, a few other happy points. Oh, let's use smiley faces for our happy points. Um, when you do these problems, the way we make them interesting is to think about where does V come from. Right, so V can come from three places. So V is just the speed of the wave. It could come from pulse data. So last time I did a quick problem where I said, OK, imagine a pulse goes down a string and gets back in 230 milliseconds. So that's how I got the speed. I said the total distance times 2, because it went up and back, and divided by the 230 milliseconds. So it could be some experimental description that gives you, some experiment that gives it to you. It could be the string properties. Now we know a string, the wave speed is, depends on the tension and the mass density. That's another way. So you could have a problem where it says, you have a string with a certain mass density. There's a weight hanging off of it, creating tension. Oh, the tension must be mg. Right? And then you go, go from, once you have v, then you're good. Or it could be uh, values. They might say a wave uh, supports, uh, I'm sorry, a string supports a wave with frequency f, 2 hertz, and wavelength, well, that's ridiculous, 20 hertz, and wavelength, you know, 0.1 meter. If you have a numerical value for f and lambda, you have v right there. v equals frequency times lambda. Okay? So problems generally are getting v from one of those is kind of what you do. And then once you have that, then you just need this. But this, you usually typically know the length of the thing. Okay? So it's really just a little bit of algebra is all these problems tend to be. You just got to have some idea what's going on. Okay? Happy point number two was that this was all strings open air basically equals the string, uh, open air column. There you go. When we solve the problem for an open air column, if you treat pressure like the height of the string, everything's the same. Right? It's got to be clamped to both ends because we think of this as the pressure, and on an open tube, this is held at atmospheric pressure, and this is held at atmospheric pressure. So those are, again, like the nodes. And then the pressure can change inside the tube. So for that, it was like almost exactly the same. And then here, oh, do we even have to calculate the speed? No. It's always at the surface of the Earth under typical atmospheric conditions, 343 meters per second. Now, I'm sure there's going to be a problem where we've made a moon colony or a colony on Mars, you know, and there's like a, they put so much water on Mars, they're having flooding. So they had to build some culverts under the driveway on Mars. And you'll hear a sound, and the question will be, what's the speed of sound in Mars? Because that's the only way it could be different. But if a problem doesn't specifically mention another planet, you can assume it's on Earth, near the surface of the Earth. Okay, I'll let you make that assumption. I don't want to have to point that out every time. Yes, this problem is on Earth. You're getting it wrong for another reason. Okay. We don't want to go through that every day. Let's see. Why is all this here? Let's see. Oh, this is for later. Okay. OK, so that was kind of just everything we did last time. Let's see if it can get more interesting, though. I bet you it can. Let's see. Oh, yes. So your assignment was to think about what's going on here, right? So this was the whistle here. So you know, we blow it, and we go And uh, it creates a sound. Let's analyze it. Let's analyze it like a science person would analyze it by running this little thing. Here we go. How long is this whistle? It is uh, 52 centimeters. 
Okay, I don't want to put this on the board. So L equals 52 centimeters. Okay, so let's predict what would the, and it's open, open, so what would the frequency that should come out of the fundamental mode be? Oh, L is 52 centimeters. For the fundamental mode wavelength, I don't even care about time. I don't care about speed, frequency. It's just twice that, 2L, right? So lambda, this thing is making, is 1.04 meters, right? 52 times 204 centimeters, 1.04 meters. So uh, 343 is the speed, is the frequency, times 1.04. So the frequency coming out of here in Hertz should be a little bit less than 343, right? A slight bit less, maybe 330, 320. So here, this is uh, the frequency of sound that the computer is hearing, okay? Thank you. Okay, here we go. Look at that, it's a log scale. It's pretty close to 343. You're so hype about this. I'm not gonna do it you know, <laughs> while I play that. No, I refuse. My kids would die, okay. So, uh, so that all made sense. But then your assignment was to do this. Uh, figure out what's going on here. We gotta think about what happens when you close one end of the tube. Okay, good, so I have this working now, so now I'll get all these texts. How do you know it is a fundamental wave? Yeah, so when you blow on something like this, you usually, you excite it at all frequencies at once, and the fundamental is usually the strongest, so. All those modes are there. It is actually exciting all the modes, but we are mostly hearing and thinking about the fundamental but I could use those numbers and calculate M equals two. So it's twice one. So they were all there. I was just telling you about the fundamental. Just because I'm a fundamental kind of guy. Um, let's see. How do you know it's a fundamental wave? Yeah, yeah. Um, how do we know it's M equals one? Yeah. Yeah, so same question, yeah. So I just, uh, I only did M equals one. So all the modes are happening at the same time. Mm, yeah. Okay, so now what we want to do is think about what happens when we close one end of the tube. All right. Um, we close one end of the tube. Close one end. And basically now we have a new situation. If we were doing it with math, we would say new boundary conditions. Ah, oh, very exciting. So we have new boundary conditions. We said before that if the tube is open, the, at the pressure, at the air pressure at the end has to stay at atmospheric pressure because it's open to the atmosphere. But now that it's closed, something else might happen. So let's look, do our molecular scale view of the closed end. Now my cartoons horribly confused people last time. So when I'm doing these dots, it's mostly just for fun. I do your best to interpret it, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, this density of dots is atmosphere, more or less. That has to remain at atmosphere, right? Because that's open. But this end, the pressure could actually go up or down. Let's imagine the pressure goes up. Okay, that's my high pressure right there, okay? So then it needs to just kind of gradually increase a little bit. I don't know, I can't do this, okay? There you go, trying to do better. Okay, so the closed end for a, a standing wave has maximum pressure difference. I mean, the pressure difference from atmospheric pressure. Right, it's gonna be atmospheric here and it can get big here. Because basically if this pressure starts moving, it's all gonna collect at the end. Or if the, you know, if the gas, every little gas atom moves a little bit, it'll sort of collect at the end like that. So if we wanted to draw the pressure plot, so this is versus X, and this is pressure, and right in the middle is atmospheric pressure. We know that at L, if this thing is L long, that it's clamped, essentially clamped for sound, right? It must be at atmospheric pressure. And we know that here it must be at an antinode, 
that's where you're going to have the maximum pressure. So we could draw one and say, well, how do we cram a sinusoid in there? We do that. What would it look like a half cycle later? A half cycle later, you'd have low pressure here. Because in addition to cramming all the air in and raising the pressure, you can suck all the air out and lower the pressure. So then it's just an anti-node, but it's negative. I'm not going to draw. Well, that's actually easier to draw because I don't have to draw as many molecules. So that's what it would look like. Okay. At the closed end, is it possible for the pressure to be be to be below, below than atmospheric pressure? Yes. So you're too slow. You can't keep up. You got to text faster. Um, yeah, but yes, so that's what I just said. So yeah, I can go both up and down. Air sloshes in and out, it goes high. Air sloshes out, it goes low. Up, down, up, down. Can it be equal to atmospheric pressure? Yes, it can be equal. Um, oh, and I did draw it here, so it looks like that. There you go. All it is is atmospheric here and then going down to lower uh, over there. Okay. So now to, to figure this out mathematically, we could go back to the big equation for normal, for standing waves and uh, plug in that it has to be zero here and a maximum here, and we could mathematically do boundary conditions, we could do all that, but we don't want to do that. All we got to do is say, how can we cram a sine wave in there? We're going to do it the easy way. We're not going to do it with the detailed boundary conditions. So what I would say, if I was doing sort of happy facts here, I would say zero to L is what? It's only a quarter of a wave. Right? Or a quarter lambda, I guess I would say. A quarter of a wavelength. Right? And that's how we'll do the boundary conditions. We won't do all the math with the sine KL and all that. Um, so therefore, what we would say is that lambda equals 4L. Right? So immediately we see that the wavelength gets longer than open open. Longer than open open. O slash O is what I mean open open. The open tube. Wavelength gets longer. What's the frequency? Do you have to do a bunch of complicated math? No. The speed over 4L. That's all you got to do to get the frequency. It's the speed over the wavelength. V, that over there. And what is that? That's a lower frequency. Was that moving or am I? OK. I thought I was about to pass out. OK. That's moving up. OK. All right? That's a uh, lower frequency. Because if we go back up here, right? It was uh, for the fundamental, uh, whatever, you know. 2L to 4L, V over 2L, V over 4L. It goes down, OK? Now, again, but this is all n equals 1. We haven't done the general case yet, frame equals 1. So it's predicting that the frequency goes down by a factor of 2. So let's see if that really happens. <sighs> Oops, sorry. Excuse me. I just apologize. There it is right there, right? It dropped to like 160. So it dropped by a factor of two. So all we've done was we're looking at we're looking at the fundamental between uh, the open and the closed tube. And it follows the math, everything works. Okay? So it would seem that that's pretty easy. You just divide by two. <laughs> Whenever something seems easy in physics, it means it's going to be soul-crushingly difficult. Okay, that's usually what happens. Okay. So now, what we want to do... I don't need to look at that again. We don't need it. We've seen enough. Yeah, we see it again. It's not that... It doesn't look good. Okay, let me get rid of that. I've got two questions here. Um, what would a fundamental look like for an open closed? Yeah, so we drew that. Why was L only one-fourth of lambda? Yeah, so that's the part, instead of doing it mathematically, we just did it graphically. What is the longest, the first sinusoid you can write between 0 and L that is 0 here and has a maximum value there? Right? I mean, the shortest one, or the, the shortest one you can put in there is to have one end be at 0 and one end be at maximum. It's the other way. One end be at 0, one end be at maximum. That's the way we got that number. It's totally graphical. Okay? You might see it a little better when we do the next one as we go to higher modes. Okay? We can do all the math. But just, it's not worth it. You're better off thinking of it this way. Um, what is 0 to L? So that's like the length of the tube. Yeah, so, yeah, so sorry, I just got covered up from 0 to L is the length of the tube. Okay. Just like L was the length of the string. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Yes, OK. So now we're going to do higher modes. 
of open closed tubes. Okay? It looks like all we did was divide by four, or divide by two, but we're going to see what else we might need to do here. So I'll go ahead and try to draw them. These drawings are horrible. There's really no point. So another tube, zero to L. It's open closed. We know this has to be atmospheric pressure. Okay? We know this, we're going to go with the high value, right? So this is greater than atmospheric pressure at the end because it's closed. It can go up and down, up and down, all right? So in this mode, that didn't happen. It just went continuously from atmospheric and it went up to something high. But you just got to think about how do I cram the next shortest wavelength into this space such that this remains down at zero and this remains an antinode? And you just say, well, uh, great, yeah. Instead of starting here at the node, or it's atmospheric pressure, instead of going to here, we go to here. All right. And then it's an anti-node again. You know, we don't go twice as far. Right? If we went twice as far, you might say, well, just stick half a sinusoid in here. But that's not right. Because if you stick half a sinusoid in here, what is this? This is a node at atmospheric pressure. You don't have that at the end of the tube. So we have to actually stick more in. We have to actually make it look like this. This is L from zero to L. We're plotting the pressure. There's atmospheric pressure. And this has to be zero. This has to be an antinode. Before we did this, we can't go down. So we have to say, oh, it's like, oh, that was the worst sinus. like that. There we go. We stuck in. We just basically shortened the sinusoid until we got an antinode again. That's all we did. We pushed this in until we got to another antinode. That's, that was the bad case. Okay, let's look. So you draw that. Think about that. Uh, what does that say next to longer than? I don't know. Uh, o slash O. That means open, open. O slash O. This will be O slash C. Here we go. There you go. Now ask me what that is. Okay. So this is m equals two. Okay. If I were going to draw all this, I'd probably maybe I would draw it really high density here and low density here, or we could flip this over. If you look at it a cycle later, half a cycle later, it looks like this. So there's your standing mode. A string can't do this because a string can't be unclamped. Right. Only a sound uh, call or only an air column, you're going to see this. Okay. Let's do m equals 3. Not going to draw the molecules. We're just going to remember that this is at atmospheric pressure, and this is somehow different from atmospheric pressure. So let's draw it here, 0 to L. We're plotting the pressure. There's atmospheric pressure. All right. How are we going to draw m equals 3? What's going to have to happen? Why is pressure at the end lower than p atmosphere on the graph, but higher in the drawing. Uh, yeah, so I, it's either. Okay, I could have drawn this solid and this dashed. I can draw either one. And I just had a mental lapse, and I drew it high and then later drew this low. I should have had this come down for, I should have drawn this one. See? It really doesn't matter. Both happen in the standing mode. Okay. When you draw this high, it doesn't stay high. As the thing oscillates, it goes high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. Right? So that's why don't, you don't worry about drawing these. If you can think mathematically, you'll be better off. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's see this one. So if you had time to think about it during uh, that discussion, maybe you can figure out, we just keep shoving the sinusoid down until we get another antinode. So it must be that we have to, oh, should I make it match? Let's see. So we have to go like this, like this, and like that. Uh-huh. So it looks like that. And then half a cycle later, it's going to look like this. And you can draw either the dashed or the dot or the solid, whichever one you want, but you'd have basically uh, atmospheric pressure and then an antinode, and then atmospheric pressure, and then an antinode, and atmospheric pressure, and an antinode, if you want to draw all those dots. My dot drawings become useless when the density gets that high. What's the wavelength of the m equals 2 graph? Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. OK. Uh, let's get there right now. Let's see. So um, L. equals how many waves here? 
it's basically equal to three quarters of a wave, isn't it? Here's the wavelength, here's half the wavelength, another quarter of the wavelength, and then one more quarter would have finished it. So it's three fourths lambda there. And then what is this one? It has a whole wave in it. Look at that. Oh, and one more quarter. L is five fourths lambda there. So that's how the wavelengths change uh, for the modes. So let's describe it mathematically then. Okay, so here we go. Open, closed modes. And this is where the difference is going to pop out, if it hasn't popped out for you already. Is you would say, okay, it was clearly lambda over 4 here, right? Lambda, uh, or let's see, uh, lambda is, was 4L here. So we, now we need to describe it with an M. We need to be able to say, okay, well, it was 4L over M, and the wavelength um, is uh, getting um, shorter here. So it'd say lambda at some mode number or some M is uh, 4L over M. And the question is, does that really work? Uh, let's write, uh, so what you do is you, it's the avoidance. 90% of your life, you're just avoiding your problems, right? Let's not worry about if it works. Let's write the frequency while we're here. Ah, uh, yeah, well, I know that that must be V over 4L, and I'll put the M right there. So does that, does it work? Is it right? We could say, well, it's right here. When M equals 1, it's right there, right, a quarter of a wave. M equals 2, what is it? It's 2L. Rut row, this isn't 2L, right? Doesn't work. That would be a half right here. So the deal is the way open closed tubes fit in is you have to uh, skip a mode, right? We didn't just uh, shove this to be half a wave, we had to add another to get to an antinode. So the way to make this work mathematically is that the m's are not all integers, it's the odd positive integers. Seven, nine, blah, blah, blah. okay? So that's the difference. Open, open, and clamp strings, you have these formulas, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Open, closed, you have formulas that are different by a factor of two, and it's one, three, five, seven, nine. That's the difference. And if you're putting in one, three, five, seven, nine, you can imagine that the frequency spacing is also a little bit different. All right, for the, when we played this open, we, we, you could kind of tell they're evenly spaced. If you play it closed, it's hard to see the higher order modes in closed. That's why I'm not going to show it to you. But if you squint your eyes and subtract the background, you can convince yourself the pattern is actually like this, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. They're spaced twice as far apart, and they're kind of shifted closer to zero. Okay? But we did see the difference. We did see when you put in 1, they both have m equals 1. That's why the frequency went down by 2. But if you looked for the next mode, it wouldn't be a 2 here. You'd have to put a 3 here. Okay. So you'll see problems like that. Maybe the next time we have this on, I'll try to show you. But the peaks are hard to see. Uh, okay. What is the wavelength of the m equals 2 graph? Oh, we did that. Or any even number. Uh, why is m equals 2 not valid for open close? Okay, so we just said that. So there, so our out m equal 2, so our m equal 2 graph and drawing is wrong. Uh, no, everything's right. Oh, yes, sorry. This is me making the classic mistake. <laughs> when I said m equals 2, we were just doing the second mode. We hadn't done the math yet. Okay, I meant to say second mode, not m equals 2. Okay, so this is the confusing thing. This is my illustration of the confusion you will go through, okay? Is that uh, this is the second mode, and this is the third mode, and this is three, and this is five. I meant to play that as I did that on purpose. Okay? So M does not mean the mode number. M is a set of integers. There is no variable that means the mode number. You just have to read the problem and let them say the sixth mode or the seventh mode. Now, to make this further confusing, just a little bit more confusing, is, let's think about this. You might be reading a different book. There is a way I could write this equation and use all the m's. Right? I could say, let's put this, instead of calling it m, let's call it 2m minus 1. Right? I could put a 2m minus 1 here and a 2m minus 1 here. And I'd say, okay, when m equals 1, what is this? 1. When m equals 2, what is this? 3. When m equals 3, what is this? 5. Right? You can generate the odd integers with all the integers. So if you see this in a book, don't freak out. If you look at the end, it probably says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for m. But where your book doesn't do this, it just writes them odd. Okay? But if you do that, then you can say m is equal to the mode number. Okay? I didn't create the universe. I know it's confusing. I apologize. I apologize on behalf of the universe. 
Let's see, higher modes, yada yada. Tricky terminology I've basically explained throughout. So what we're going to do to finish up standing waves is we are going to look at how standing wave problems work. Okay, standing wave problems. How to do them. All right. So one thing, this is just some happy bullets, not happy points here, is that boundaries um, give you lambda. So if a problem just asks you for, or if the first part of a problem just asks you for what's, what are the wavelengths, and you know the length of the tube or the string, that you're done, right? There's no velocity, there's no time to think about, anything like that. If it's a clamped string, so I need you to look at your context here. Clamped probably means a string. O slash O, open air column. Then it's always simply L equals 2L, or lambda equals 2L over M, like we just said. This is all M. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, blah, 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 blah. If it's OC, right, open, close, then lambda equals 4L over M. And now you got to keep up with the context. That's not all M, right? That's 1, 3, 5. I'm trying just not to completely overload the board here, okay? All integers, odd integers. If it's deep OC, it's 8L over M. Okay. There's, only, there's only OC, okay? But notice you don't even need the velocity of the frequency yet. If you just want these wavelengths, then it's just geometry. How many sinusoids can I cram in that 0 to L, okay? And then the wave speed is the length to frequency. Obviously, to get to frequency, we need something about time. And I sort of talked about it already. We know that the velocity of the wave is the frequency times the wavelength, so you can just solve that for f. So all the time, once you have this, you simply say v over lambda. Okay. And I got ahead of myself and already talked about the three ways to get velocity. Okay. So then the last uh, homework helper point to make is sometimes you've got to think about you've got to think about the frequency spacing, okay? The frequency, or the, the mode frequency spacing. In some problems, they'll say there's a bunch of modes. And one is at 40 and one is at, fi one's at 40 hertz, one's at 50 hertz. And you gotta think, what is that, what is that told me? So let's look at sort of like an axis of frequency here. We're now in frequency space, okay? And let's think about if we have um, a clamped or an open, open kind of a system, right? Open, open. Well, we know that the frequencies go with all the integers starting at m equals 1. So that's going to create frequencies that are just evenly spaced. So here's m equals 1. Uh, here's m equals 2. m equals 3. m equals 4. Right? So they're, they're usually labeled like F1, F2, F3, F4, kind of like that. But what if we want the open-closed? So just visually start getting this in your head, if you can see this here, OC. The first one was a half down, right? So that's F1. And then the spacing still has to be the wavelength. So the second one here is twice the first one. But that's not the case in open-closed. You actually just move the same spacing, right? And then this one is here, still right in between like that, okay? So you can always use the spacing of the frequencies to get, uh, to, uh, to understand uh, the system, but open, open, and clamped are nice and uniform with M. Open, closed are kind of like offset down by half a wave or by half of the frequency like that, okay? So that pattern, you know, you're not gonna use that mathematically, but that pattern is good to be familiar with when you're when you're doing problems, okay? All right, so we'll take our, uh, our required five minute break and do superposition next. One more question, it was probably related to my little problem I created, you probably figured it out now, but somebody asked a very general question, what's the relationship between mode and M? So let's just say it one more time, for clamped and for open open, the mode number, first, second, third, fourth, equals m. But for uh, 
the open closed, it doesn't equal m. The first mode is 1, the second mode is 3, the third mode is 5, right? Because the m's go uh, odd integer for the open closed, okay? So just say that one more time because I did screw it up a little bit, sort of on purpose, maybe not. Okay, we're actually done with standing waves. That was it. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, man. Not for the whole semester, no. Okay, we're gonna, oh wait, here you go. But we're gonna go back to traveling waves. Oh, no, yes. But first we gotta tie it all together with a concept huge in physics called superposition. Okay, physicists, we love to make up fancy names for things. We love it, makes us feel important, okay? So I'm gonna tell you what superposition is, really briefly. Uh, it's called this, waves add. Okay, that's really all you have to say, okay? Superposition, you would ask, what happens if two pulses on a string are moving along and they're gonna hit? The drama is just huge. What is gonna happen? This is pulse Y1. The Y is the deflection of the string. It's moving that way. This is Y2. And they get closer. Oh, I can't take it. All right, Y1, Y2. And they get closer. Let's do the demo and find out. Okay. I need somebody down here with a good sense of rhythm and fast hands. Okay. I need someone down here with a good sense of rhythm and fast hands. Yeah, because I can't do this by myself. I am fast. You get on. I'm not, I'm not that fast. Look at this brave soul. What's your name? Uh, David. David. What college are you from, David? Duncan. Duncan. Oh, you want to go out for a drink after? No, we better not. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do is uh, make a pulse. So this is how you make a pulse on a string. In so much trouble. <laughs> okay, what you do is you hold your finger here, and then you release, watch this. Boom, pulse goes down, right? So practice a couple of those. Hold your finger here and pull it down like that. Oh. I didn't want to be a magister anymore anyway. Okay, Okay. try one more. Look at, look at David's pulse, it's beautiful. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're going to both send a pulse at the same time. And your job is to watch in the middle and see what happens. Okay, watch the middle very closely. He needs a good sense of rhythm because I'm going to go one, two, three, go. So we have to release it at just the same time. He's already a natural at it, I can tell. We've got to have the same amplitude, more or less. You ready? Hold on, I've got to calm down for a second. I'm tired. Okay, ready? One, two, three, go. Was it bigger? Cool, I have it on captured on video. We're going to be YouTube famous. Are you ready? One more time. One, two, three, go. Was it bigger? I will post it in slow motion. Stay there, David. So it got bigger, but that's not the cool one. Now, that's, you might call that constructive interference. Two pulses made a bigger pulse. What if I invert my pulse? Ooh, right. So you pull down, same. I'm going to invert my pulse, and it should go flat for an instant. Ready? One, two, three, go. Whoa, just assume it went flat. It's too fast to see. <laughs> But we'll know when we check the slow motion. Thank you, David. Let's hear it for David. Very brave man. Wow, nice pulse work there. So you saw two positive pulses, waves add. If you have a positive pulse, approach a negative pulse, and they hit if you literally just add. So Y superposition of these two is literally just Y1 plus Y2, right? Just algebraically, Y1 plus Y2. That's all it is. All right, so who cares? I mean, why are we even writing that down? Why is that important? So basically what I want you to know, well, we're gonna use that mathematically. Um, let me write this a little more uh, detailed. So just for your notes, the waves uh, pass through each other is one thing this, this uh, leads to. Kind of like me saying normal modes, this is huge in physics, this is wildly important. Basically, if the wave equation causing the wave to move is linear, then the solutions superpose. It means that waves go through each other. Wouldn't it be weird if I had a flashlight and you had a flashlight and the two waves bounced off of each other? What kind of a world would that be? Kind of cool, right? That does happen if the wave equation is nonlinear. You may have heard of nonlinear optics. Nonlinear optics is a light goes into a medium that's nonlinear and pulses can bounce off and change frequency. All kinds of crazy stuff can happen. But in the linear world, we obey superposition, and the two waves, really, they don't even know each other exist. But if we observe the total effect, we see things like, oh, the pulse is bigger for a minute, or that the pulse disappears, okay? 
So this technically is a way that we link um, traveling waves and normal modes and superposition is the thing, or uh, interference, which is what this next subject is about. So let me show you how they're linked. You may wonder um, why are there two different kinds of modes on a string? It's one string, there's one wave equation, why do we have two fundamentally different kinds of solutions? And the answer is we really don't. So this is a plot of green as a, as a uh, traveling wave going this way, blue is a traveling wave going that way. Same frequency, same wavelength, same speed. And you might intuitively say, well, if that happens, every part of the string is always going to move. But if you look at this carefully, it actually doesn't, right? There'll be some places, like right here, where when this one is low, that one is high. And when that one is, sorry, uh, is low, this one is high. See, if I put my thing right there, it's staying right at zero. It's a node, right? And you say, well, how can that happen? Does that always happen? It doesn't happen here, right? It only happens in certain places and only at certain frequencies. So it's basically, it's the normal mode. Right? So you can see the red is the sum of those two normal mode. So really, I'm sorry, standing wave. So really a standing wave is just a superposition of two traveling waves. But you only get the standing wave under very specific conditions, like you have to have your boundaries clamped here, just like we were with standing waves. Right? They only occur for certain very specific conditions. So that's why uh, the book actually starts with superposition. That's the first thing it talks about in the chapter, is to kind of explain what it is. It's because it's closely linked to both standing waves and interference, and because they just wanted to cram it all into one chapter. I mean, that's also, let's be real, okay? But there, there is a fundamental reason that, that it's so important. Okay, so now what we're going to do mathematically is we're going to uh, overlap two one-dimensional sound waves, mathematically and in real in the real world. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Let's do it over here because that board annoys me. Okay, so here we go. This is the math part, okay? Let's over, oh, goodness. overlap two, oh, let's not use all numbers, two identical one-dimensional uh, sound waves. Okay, let's see. So I'm going to draw them like this. One is here. This is speaker one, and this is speaker two, and they're both making a sound wave like that. And identical, they're the same frequency, same wavelength, they're starting out at the same phase. I had it, I was in phase briefly, <laughs> and then I fell out of phase, but you get the idea. Okay, same F, lambda, and A. And phi naught, if you remember what that is. We'll get to it in a minute, okay? Actually, not the same phi naught, sorry. Same frequency, uh, frequency, wavelength, and amplitude, just to make, a, make the math work out. Okay, so now we're going to write, uh, I'm calling it big D, I don't remember why. I'm going to call it big D1 and big D2. I think D meaning, oh, yeah, I remember. It's because the book likes to talk about the displacement of the air rather than pressure. So you'll get used to that. You'll, it's okay, same as pressure. So let's write the wave for one. It's A sine... Right, I'm going to write kx1 minus omega t plus phi naught 1. Oh my god. Does anybody know what all that is? Okay. Amplitude. The first person would take the easy one. A is the amplitude. Remember, k is just a, a $3 version of lambda, right? 2 pi over lambda. That's just the wavelength. I'm describing x1 because we may move these around with respect to each other, right? x is how far you are from the origin or from the source. So we may do problems later where we're different distances from the two sources. We're going to move them around, right? We may say, you're here, and I'm going to pull one back. So they can each have their own x, their own individual x's. K, x, 2. They can't have their own individual times, OK? We could say, let's have each one in a separate universe where time is different. Let's not do that. OK, let's move them in space, but not move them in time. So we have our angular frequency, which is really just part of uh, another way of saying f, times the same time. But they could have their own phase constants. So remember, the phase constant is like where the phase starts, phi naught, phi naught 2. 
So maybe at time equals zero, this one is down here to negative, so it's acting like a negative sign. And maybe at time equals zero, this one is at zero. Or maybe they're 10 degrees different at time equals zero. But they could each have their own phase constant, OK? OK, so see if any of that, that all hopefully makes a little bit of sense. Amplitudes, k omega you're good with. They could move in space, and they could have their own phase constants. Now you might say, if it acts like a negative sign, why don't you just put a negative sign in there? But what's mathematically convenient is to call everything a positive sign and to deal with the differences in here. It seems like it'd be easier to do it out here, but no, it's easier to do it in here. Okay? But it's the same thing. If I wanted it to look like a cosine, I would say, well, this is pi over 2. Or I could write a cosine here and make this 0. Right? It's, all, it's technically the same thing. Phase is hard to deal with because that's why I did the survey at the beginning. What's the scariest part of a wave? The phase. So right now we're going to obsess with the phase for quite a bit. Here we go, with lots of words. Okay? So let's get our, our, note, our words correct. So last semester, I think I made a big deal about this, but we're going to do it again. The entire argument um, of the sine function of the sine function is the phase. Okay? You have to be actually a little bit careful what you say if you want to be perfect. And remember, you have to be perfect in this class. So if I'm pointing to this, I can't call that the phase. That is the phase constant. This whole thing is the phase. Everything under the sign is the phase, OK? Is the phase um, all terms uh, together tell you where you are in the sinusoid. Sinusoid just means generalized sine or cosine. So where I am on this thing depends not just on the phase constant, but also on time and space. Right? Depends on all of them. So I'll try to always call that the phase. Okay? So if we wanted to write these two phases, we would say phi 1, not phi not 1, phi 1, the entire phase, is equal to kx1 minus omega t plus phi not 1. And if I want to write the entire phase for wave 2, kx2, wherever that one is, time is universal, minus omega t, plus its own phase offset, or phase constant. OK, okay so they each have a phase. It's got little variables in it that you like. We're hanging in there. We have more points to make. OK. Right, and then phi 1, and then just, just to have it in your notes later, let's just remember the difference between phi 1 and phi 2, phi not 1 and phi not 2 are the phase constants. So just in case you forget what those are, not and 1, OK. OK, what are we going to do with all that information? I forgot, so let's find out. Oh, yeah. OK. OK, so we said that waves superpose like this. We even make it a verb, superpose. Waves superpose like this. But this is a pulse, right? We're dealing with sinusoids. So let's see what sinusoids can do. So uh, yeah, wave superposition. So when I say wave, I mean now a sinusoid, not a pulse. Right? So let's imagine they're like this. Let's plot them like this. La, 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 like that. La, 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 like that. Where we're plotting D here, basically. And I don't know if that's X or time. Doesn't matter. All right? Plot them versus X. And what I would say is uh, these two is what we would call in phase. All right? Where this one is high, this one is high. Where this one is low, this one is low. Where this one is zero, this one is zero. They're together. They look the same. What would we get if we were to plot them? If this is 1 and this is 2, what we would get is just a bigger amplitude. Mm -hmm, right? Like that. 0 plus 0 is still 0, but a 1 plus 1 is 2. And minus 1 plus minus 1 is minus 2. So that's in phase. And that's what we would call constructive. Why do we have two phi's in the equation? What's the difference between the two variables? Two phi's, yeah. So these are the phase constants. Yeah. 
Um, let's see. So this is in phase, or what we call constructive interference. You may have heard that before. Interference. Right? So you can imagine what's coming up. What if the other case is they are out of phase? All right, so what if this one starts up, up, down, up, down, up, down, but this one goes down and then up, and then down and then up. So this is out of phase. And the result of this would be, I'm done. Right, there it is. All right, so this is always up and this is always down. Cancels, zero plus zero is zero. Negative one, positive one, zero, zero, zero is zero, plus one, minus one, zero. So this is destructive interference. Destructive interference. Okay. Um, an interesting question, I won't draw it. What if they're kind of in between? Okay. What if they're not perfectly aligned this way and they're not perfectly aligned that way, but it's just over a little bit? Do you get some weird bumpy pattern? The answer is no, you actually just get a sine, a sinusoid. The sum of any two sinusoids at the same frequency and wavelength even if they're offset a little, the result actually ends up just being a sinusoid. It might be a little surprising the first time you see it, but if you plot some, get in your calculator and do some plots and get two sinusoids, they don't have to be the same amplitude. Uh, yeah, they don't have to be the same amplitude. Same frequency, same wavelength, and just shift one by a little bit and plot it again. It'll be a perfect sinusoid. Okay? But we're mostly in our problems, you can imagine, we focus on the extreme cases, the constructive interference and the destructive interference. Okay. Why do we have two, yeah. uh, can you draw the destructive, please? Okay, here we go. There, there we go. So uh, I didn't draw it because it's zero, right? It's, it's zero everywhere. Um, and let me label this more clearly then maybe. So this is one and this is two, one, two, and this is one plus two. That's the part I didn't put on there. This is one plus two. It gives you nothing everywhere you go. I'm curious how it looks. Yeah, so there you go. There's nothing wrong with any question, okay? It's hard to keep up. I talk very fast. Okay, so now here's the key. What is the difference in these? The type of interference that you get depends on another phase, if you can believe that, on the phase difference. Yet another word we have to know about phase, right? There's the phase under the sinusoid, there's the phase constant, which is like the offset from zero, but then there's the difference of two phases, phi two minus phi one. Yet another one, right? So what's the phase difference here in radians? Zero, right? These are in phase. The only way this could happen is if these two things are identical. And if they're identical, one minus the other is zero. Right, so here for, um, I'll go ahead and write it over here for constructive, oh, this is getting kind of messy, sorry, for this one, delta phi equals zero. That's the case of in phase. I'm probably going to write this again. Out of phase, delta phi equals what? Well, you can tell by looking, it must be half a cycle, which is pi. If we're doing it in radians, it's pi. If we're doing it in degrees, it's 180 degrees. Okay. So the whole name of the game for this part of the class is to calculate delta phi. That's like what all the homework will be about. Calculate delta phi, how does it depend on where the sources are, etc. okay? So let's do a little bit of that. Uh, let's see. Let's see if this will stay down. Ooh, I'm gonna get something to wedge it. Here we go. Yes, yes here we go. That was almost cool, there we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. So let's write. What is phi? Oh my. Oh, that wasn't the problem. But this one goes up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Straight. Okay. I don't know what to do anymore. Okay. Let's go over here. Let's just pull this up. Okay. So now the question we have is: We got to calculate phi two minus phi one. Uh, minus phi one. Well, you literally just substitute these in, right? Let's, it's going to get complicated here, but let's just write it down. Kx2 minus omega t plus phi naught, I'm sorry, 1, 1, yeah. Let's do 1, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2 minus 1, sorry. Get your pencil out, yeah, don't use pen. There you go. 
That's the main advice for my classes, don't use pen. Okay. Uh, no, that's not a question. Um, and uh, minus phi 1, minus kx1 uh, minus omega t uh, plus phi naught 1. Okay. So there it is. So now let's simplify it. Minus omega t plus omega t, right? So time is universal. It's not going to depend on time. And then we have, if we want to simplify it algebraically, they have the same wavelength. They have the same k. So it's x2 minus x1. So the distance part looks like that. The difference in their position, the difference of how far you are from each one times the wave number. And then we have plus phi naught 2 minus phi naught 1. Oops. Right? Plus the difference in phase. They may have some initial phase difference that's causing you to see some effect. Okay. So let's remember, so this is, in your problems, this is how far from each source. And let's remember, what the heck are we even calculating? What is this delta phi again? This is the difference in phase due to the sources. But here's the final thing I want to say. At a point, okay, at a single point in space, okay? This is not calculating delta phi for these two waves everywhere. It's at a single point in space, right? So I didn't really draw that here, but like the, where the person is, they're going to think about their difference, different distance to x1 to the two speakers. The way I drew it, he's the same distance, unless we get into 2D, which we'll do soon, okay? But anyway, that's what this thing is telling you. Now let's simplify it even a little bit more and say the way it's usually written in terms of variables that you like is you just change the uh, k to 2 pi over lambda, and you call that delta x, okay? So you say it's 2, uh, I usually put the, I can put the 2 pi in front, delta x over lambda, plus the change, the difference in phi naught. So this is the general difference in, or phase difference equation. That's the one you use to solve problems, all right? So then if we want to define it, we would say delta x is usually the separation it depends on the problem, really, the separation of the sources, right? Because you're in one place, right? So the distance to each one, if there's going to be a number you're going to put there, x2 minus x1, that's like how far apart the sources are. Or if you don't like that, you can go all the way back to this equation every time. But that's what it is. And then delta phi is the difference in the phase constants. And which one is important for the problem depends on the problem. Right? It might say two speakers uh, operate in phase. What that means is they have the same source phase. That means this is zero, but they're separated from where you are. They have different positions to you. That means delta x is different. Or it might say two speakers are both the same distance from you, but their source is out of phase. Let me show you how that works. Let's do something like that. Because I don't think you believe me. I'm seeing some looks that are like, yeah, well, you're full of crap. I don't believe you. So here we go. Here are two speakers. Look, they're camouflaged in this room because they're made out of dark wood. But there's two speakers here. Okay. I'm going to turn this on. And the best frequency to do this is 70 hertz, roughly. All right. So we're turning this one on. People are getting restless here. Oh, can everybody hear that? Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Can you stay awake? Yes. So what I'm going to do now is add the second speaker, okay? And we're going to see if the second speaker makes it louder or softer, okay? Let's see. Did it get louder or softer? Louder, yes, it gets louder. So here's one speaker, two speakers. One speaker, two speakers. Let's think, what is the delta phi? What is the difference in position of this two speakers to your head? Basically zero, right? It's not quite 1D because you guys are everywhere, but this is the separation, and that's the distance, so it's zero. So delta x is zero. What is delta phi? Well, I'm driving them with the same source, right? So if I'm driving them with the same source, the phase difference is zero. The two little diaphragms are moving together like this. I can actually see it. If you had the strobe light, you could see it, but I can tell. The two diaphragms are doing that, making two waves in phase, going the same distance to your ear. Therefore, delta phi is zero. Right? If delta phi is zero, it's constructive. 
under there. Right? If it's constructive, the waves add, you hear a louder sound. Okay? Now I'm going to make it destructive. Are you ready? Look very closely here. You see this? I'm going to turn it like that. Okay, I just changed the voltage polarity. Now when this one's positive, this one's negative. Now we'll see if it gets louder. It goes away. Look at that. You hear some buzzing of the thing, but it basically goes down. Let me turn it back constructive. Louder. Let me turn it destructive. Goes away. Now, flash quiz. Which term is making it destructive? This, 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 this. Right, I'm changing the source phase by flipping the little wire around. Right, loud, soft, like that. Okay? So that's an example of constructive and destructive. Let me see if these questions are what's going on here. And we'll look at one more thing. What does delta phi look like on a graph? It depends on what's on the x-axis. I'm not, that's not something we would think about a lot. Um, what if the sources produce different wavelengths and you're in the wrong class? You've gotten into sophomore physics. So you're, you, you should leave the room and go to the right class. No. So we're going to keep the wavelengths the same. Okay. Okay. So that is an example of how um, uh, the phase uh, affects things. Let's see. So we did that. Multiple constructive interference. Now let's move a speaker. We'll also do an example of moving a speaker. Let's see, and that's more complicated, so I'll go ahead and draw it real quick here. So this is what your homework's gonna look like. So now, are a lot of problems look like. Move a speaker. Okay, so we're gonna have speaker one here, and we're gonna put speaker two here. Right, and they're both gonna have the same wavelength. I'm gonna plug them in the same way, so they're gonna have the same phase, they're gonna have the same phase constant, but they're gonna have different x. Right, there's going to be a delta x. What exactly is the phase, though? Not mathematically, but conceptually. The phase is where you are on that curve. That's what the phase is. Just plot sine of x, and it's x. It's where you are in a sinusoid. Am I at the maximum? Am I at the minimum? Am I at zero? Am I at pi over two? It's just where you are. Okay. So let's put these here. Now, there's only one u. I mean... There's like four billion people on Earth, let's get real. There isn't only one you, but let's just say there's only one you. So your ear is in one place, right? Okay. So all that really matters is X1 and X2. It's just the distance between the two speakers, right? Delta X, right? So to do the problems, you don't really have to calculate X1 and X2. You don't even have to know X1 and X2. This could be 10 meters away, this could be one meter away. All that matters is the difference here, delta X. That's why we write the formula in terms of delta x. You don't absolutely have to know x1 and x2. You just have to know delta x. Okay? So let's uh, look at it and say, let's solve it for this system. Let's write it for this system and say uh, delta phi. We want it to be, how, when's it going to be constructive? Okay, it's going to be constructive when delta phi equals, um, oh, do I want to do zero? I don't want to do zero. I want to do, um, it, uh, sh yeah, you don't want to do zero, you want to do two pi. I forgot my good explaining justification for that, but just set equal to two pi. If two waves, if you shift them by two pi, you're shifting it by a wavelength, okay? It's sort of like the reason we don't do a standing mode with m equals zero, where the first one is m equals one. It's kind of related to that. So let's say it's constructive, two pi equals this whole thing. We said this is zero because we're plugging them in together. So two pi equals uh, two pi delta x over lambda. Right? So this is telling us it's constructive is what I'm saying. I had a notes breakdown there. Okay? So when is it constructive? It's constructive when uh, uh, delta x equals what? Cancels one delta x over lambda is one when delta x equals lambda is when it's constructive. What about destructive? It's destructive when the delta phi equals pi, right? When pi equals 2 pi delta x over lambda. So it's destructive when cancel, cancel, 1 half, when um, delta x equals half of a lambda. You bring the lambda up here and the 2 down there, when delta x equals 1 half lambda. 
Right. So that's where we've solved that for this specific case of two speakers and how far you are from the ear. So let's see if we can show you that to make sure everybody believes me before we go here. Okay, so now we're gonna do this one up at ah, 170, I think, is the magic frequency to do this one here. So this speaker, and then it gets louder. So at uh, 340, let's do 343. The frequency is 343, which is, you know, let's, what's the wavelength that the frequency is 343? Uh, the speed equals 343. So this is speed, this is frequency, and this is lambda. So it's one. So that has a one meter wavelength. Okay, what did I do with my meter stick? Okay. So you probably hear it at a maximum right now. Okay. So if I make the delta x equal to a half of a wave, it's going to go away. So I'm not going to mess with the electronics at all. All I'm going to do is push this forward by a half a wave. Okay, so think about how loud that is, right? Did it get quieter? Yeah, let me put it back in phase. Oh, did it get louder? It sounds exactly the same to me. If you just agree with what I say and nod your head, we leave earlier. So did it get, did it get quieter? Now what if I make delta x equal to a whole wavelength? I don't have enough chord. Here we go. Okay, it's quiet. Did it get louder again? Yes, we want to go. Yes. Okay, here we go. We're going to go loud, quiet, loud. Loud, destructive, constructive. Okay, that's literally like two or three of the homeworks. It's just moving a speaker around. Now, it might do this. One of the homeworks is like this. You can come do that if that helps you. Okay. All right, I'll see you next week. Yeah.